Um, I'm Kristen Bubb, and I'm a faculty member in Ed Psych um, in the Developmental Sciences Division. Um, and my, my area of research is on socio-emotional development and um, how it's related to academic achievement. Um, for those of you who have been to recent job docs, I can actually answer why it's important and would be happy to. But for today, I'm going to focus a little bit on the work that we've been doing um, in this particular case in Tajikistan and then talk a little bit about where we're going from here. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of an overview, so I'm going to talk briefly about Tajikistan. Number one question I have gotten so far is where? So we'll talk about where. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the partnership that I have with the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, talk a little bit about this multi-stage process that we're using as we develop socio-emotional tools for these international contexts, um, the process that we've gone through with that. Um, and then the next stage that we're working on, and I just came back last week from um, Tajikistan where we were starting to have conversations and training um, what they call educational methodologists, but professional development folks on how we integrate emotions into the classroom. Um, as you'll hear, this is a former Soviet Republic. So anger is a really strong emotion, um, lots of expression of anger, but not much expression of anything else. So we're working on some positive emotions as well as strong negative emotions, uh, controlling some of those. Um, and then I'll give you um, a quick scenic tour of some of the, um, some of the sites that we've, we've seen. Um, in particular, there are a couple of scenes of the road. My students know that you fly into Dushanbe, which is the capital, and then in order to get to Korog, which is the, one of the next sort of big cities, and I use big because it's not big, um, where we do most of our, where we sort of use as our base to go out. Um, it's a 14, 15 hour drive on non-paved roads. So you'll get to see some of those <laughs> non-paved roads, which are really nice. So again, and, and you know, I want this to be informal. So if you have questions, please feel, feel free to interrupt, ask questions. Um, as I said, number one question from everybody when I say I'm headed to, to Tajikistan is, where is that? So. As you can see, it's sort of in the middle of uh, Central Asia. And we've got um, to the south, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, to the east-ish, we've got China. Um, and then to the north, we've got a bunch of other stands, if you will. Um, I circled Kyrgyzstan because we're actually working with them. Um, the, these workshops that we've been doing have been regional workshops. Um, so we're really trying to build capacity within various regions. Um, and so, again, this has really been focused on, we've had folks from Afghanistan come in, and we've had folks from Kyrgyzstan come in to work with us. Um, Tajikistan is sort of housing everything. So just a little bit closer look. As I mentioned, capital city, where we fly into. Um, if you ever have a chance to go, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's got spectacular architecture. Um, Persian, I mean, you'll see in just a second, very much um, from the Persian Empire as well as from um, the Soviet times, and so very much influenced by that. Very, very rugged um, country, all mountains, so everywhere you look, gorgeous mountains. Um, my parents live in Colorado. I'm used to high mountains. They look like little hills relative to some of these, um, and there are actually trees, very few trees on these mountains. So we start here, um, fly in here, you'll get in about 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, no flight gets in in the middle of the day, um, which is real great, really fun. Um, first time I went, I flew to Dubai and then over. Second time I went through Paris and then to Istanbul and back. Neither one of them are easy. Neither one of them get you there early. Um, and then you can see a variety of rivers, but basically the road, if you will, um, travels along the river um, and through um, up into Korog. So you're basically uh, driving around through the mountains to get to Korog, which is where we really sort of, as I said, um, move out. This is in a district called, uh, it's called Gabao um, or Gorno uh, Bakdashan, I think is how they say it. Um, but, we, but we call it Gabao. Um, it's basically a set of provinces that are really mountain villages. So everybody within those contexts consider themselves mountain people. Um, similar to the US in terms of race, ethnicity, there's an identity that goes with the, being a mountain person. Um, and so you will see some tensions um, between the mountain people and others, um, if you will. Um, but 
Everything is accessed via this one road. Um, China does a lot of delivering to um, Dushanbe, and they follow the same road, the highway, if you will. Um, I will say that this work, I've been in remote areas before. This work has really made me appreciate the fact that we have roads. Even if there are potholes in the roads, <laughs> we still have roads. Um, just a quick history so you have a sense of this. As I said, it was originally part of the Persian Empire. It became a part of the Soviet Republic in the 1860s. And then in 1990, along with nine other countries, they declared sovereignty. Um, since that secession, they have had some um, civil war, some periodic civil war, but absolutely nothing since 1997. So people ask me when I go, is it safe, particularly since it's north of Afghanistan. That's the best way to describe it. I've always said it's north of Afghanistan. Um, and people have said, is it safe? And absolutely. I mean, there's been, there's been no problems. Um, they do take precautions. Um, the hotel that I stay at in Dushanbe, when you pull up to it, they actually have a little machine and they look for bombs underneath the car. Um, haven't had any problems, but they do, they're still very cautious. As you drive along the road, you do see military folks here and there, but most of them actually pay no attention. So I think they're just, I think they're warm bodies. <laughs> I don't know exactly. Um, I'm sure that if they needed to, they would engage. Um, and they are protecting the border. So um, the area is right on, the river basically separates Afghanistan from um, Tajikistan. And so they are protecting that border. Not a big country, or not a, I shouldn't say not a largely populated country. A little over 8 million people. 100% or almost 100% of the population is literate. So they're very, very committed to education, even in the rural communities. And you'll see that as I talk about this a little bit. Um, Mostly Tajik folks. Um, they also have some uh, Uzbek folks, but mostly Tajik folks, and they have a few other um, ethnicities. They have a ton of languages. So um, as we did this last workshop, I spoke in English. We had my slides translated into Russian. We had translators at each table into either Tajik or Shugni. Um, so that everybody who was participating could get some bits and pieces of it. Um, their official language is Tajik. Um, they also speak Shugni, which is a version of Tajik. It's sort of a, as they said, it's a really lousy language. It's a very underdeveloped language. Um, one of the challenges as we did this measure development was identifying these constructs and then figuring out if we actually had words in Shugni to, to talk about them. Because if we didn't, we couldn't ask those questions. Um, interestingly, folks in Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan also speak Shugni. And their language is much more comprehensive. Their Shugni version is much more comprehensive. So the Tajik folks sort of picked and chose their words. And then that was their language. Um, and then, as I said, Russian. So I actually read Russian. I don't speak it anymore, but I read the alphabet. So I could at least read some of the words um, that were being said. Um, as I mentioned, um, lots of influences, um, Persian and Russian. Um, absolutely spectacular. My dad actually sent me a text yesterday morning, and he said, check this out. And in it was something called the Dushanbe Tea House. And I was like, well, that's random. I just came from there. Why didn't you send this to me beforehand? And I could have checked it out. Turns out that Boulder, Colorado is the sister city of Dushanbe. They're north of Boulder. And they have a tea house that they constructed in Dushanbe, deconstructed, sent over to Boulder in boxes, and then failed to include the directions, actually, instructions on how to put it together. So they had to finally go back and get the architect and bring him. But there's a tea house in the middle of downtown Boulder that's actually built in Dushanbe and serves supposedly um, authentic um, Tajik food. So I plan to visit that this um, holiday season, and we'll see. Um, as I said, the terrain is absolutely um, one of the most rugged countries I've ever seen. Not a lot of trees. If you see trees, if you see greenery, it is in areas that are developed. It is, it's in areas where there are little villages, where they're actually intentionally growing um, trees and grass and that kind of stuff. More than 93% of the country is mountains, um, which makes a spectacular country. I mean, truly a spectacular country. So just a couple of pictures. Um, your, your goal when you go, particularly to Korog, is to be able to have the opportunity to fly into Korog in one of the directions, only because it cuts down on that long ride. So the first trip that I went, it was a beautiful day, and we were able to fly, you take the helicopter that's owned by the Aga Khan Foundation into Korog. Um, runway is tiny. 
cows populate the runway more than anything else. Um, so it's an exciting landing. Um, a helicopter is much better than a regular plane because at least you can sort of come straight down instead of needing the full runway. Um, but these are pictures from the um, helicopter. This is another, these are the rivers. Rivers are incredibly blue, um, absolutely blue and green, absolutely spectacular. Um, so again, this is just some, uh, just, this is a teaser because you'll see a little bit more of this, uh, but also to demonstrate that it is a rugged area. So as I mentioned and as you saw on the first slide, um, I'm partnering with the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, they asked me if I would be, be willing to provide some guidance on thinking about measuring socio-emotional skills. Um, their primary goal with this particular project is to really um, think about culturally relevant tools. So the vast majority of work in this area that's been done internationally has drawn on Western measures and in, in fact has used a lot of Western measures. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that those aren't always the most appropriate tools. They don't measure all of the skills and constructs that are necessarily relevant for survival and life within those contexts. And so Aga Khan is interested in sort of thinking about how do we do this um, in regions? How do we help people understand these skills? They recognize the importance of the skills. Um, so they're an organization, for those who aren't familiar, organization that basically works to implement community-driven solutions to any kind of problem, whether it's um, agriculture, whether it's education, whether it's health. Um, their goal is to come in, provide some supports for a group of individuals who then can really support the community and help the community, whatever it is that, that they're trying to do. But it is all community driven. It is not Aga Khan coming in and saying, here's what you need to do. Um, it's a conversation about what are your challenges. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I really respected the organization. Um, they work everywhere, primarily focused in Central Asia and Africa right now, but they work all over the world. Um, and they even do some work in the United States and, and in Canada, but not a lot. Um, their primary areas of focus, education, health, rural development, civil society. Um, obviously, I'm working in the education area. Um, they have lots of different projects going on in all of these areas. I've highlighted a few. They're looking at high quality early education. They're a firm believer in early education. Um, they've got some phenomenal programs around the world. Um, they are interested in school improvement. Um, they're interested in supporting girls' education. They've got some amazing programs in Afghanistan, really trying to get girls to not just attend school, but to stay in school past about fourth or fifth grade, which is the average. Um, and then they're also doing a lot of work um, on disaster preparedness, particularly in violence-torn communities, so war-torn communities, um, or um, they're doing a lot of work in South Africa as well. Um, so. This particular project focused on high quality edu early education um, as well as school improvement. So what they want to do or what we're doing, what we're in the process of doing is, as I mentioned, developing a culturally relevant measure of socio-emotional competencies. So sort of thinking about a process for doing that, not just here, but how do we take that process to other areas. Um, so we're really documenting what it is that we're doing. They want to be able to track the socio-emotional development of children who participate in these AKF, these Aga Khan Foundation Supported Early Child Development Centers, um, through primary school and eventually through secondary school. They're not quite there yet, but they want to do that um, eventually. As I said, they recognize the importance of social interactions. They realize that learning is a social process, that we do engage in, in these kinds of interactions as we learn, and that kids need these skills. Um, they also recognize that a lot of their children are leaving Tajikistan to go work elsewhere when they get older, um, as, they, as they reach adulthood, um, or they're leaving for school. And so they're very focused on making sure that their kids can function in societies outside of Tajikistan, um, which is also very sort of forward thinking. I left the first time and I thought, we could really learn a lot from these folks, just in the way they think about education and scaling up and sort of professional development. Um, once we've learned to measure this, um, what they wanted to do was sort of think about how do we integrate, as I mentioned, emotions into primary and secondary classrooms? How do we talk about them? How do we help kids identify them? And how do we help kids regulate? Um, the adults in particular um, are not necessarily great at controlling their emotions. And so they recognize that the first step for them is understanding how they can do that before they are able to help children do that. 
So this training that I just came back from last week was really focused on helping adults recognize their emotions and strategies for emotion regulation, and then thinking about how that might translate into the classroom. Um, they're also interested in assessing. They've got a great tool for assessing um, instructional quality, or they had a, a, well, I shouldn't say great. They had a reasonable tool for it. They were interested in doing more than counts, so that's what they did. They, they basically counted the number of times they saw stuff. And so they wanted to create a measure that allowed them to assess quality as well as quantity, um, but also that integrated sort of a, a perspective on emotional climate into the classroom. And then they're going to use that information to improve classroom climate and classroom practice. So not all that different from what's done with um, measures like the classroom assessment scoring system here in the United States, which is used both as a research tool as well as a um, um, professional development tool and observes or assesses lots of different aspects of the classroom, like instruction, like emotional climate, positive climate, negative climate, those kinds of things. So first step that we underwent um, was to develop a socio-emotional measure that was culturally relevant. I was not involved at the very beginning of this process, and I will be involved in the next, um, we're, I think we're headed to, to East Africa now, um, and so I will be involved in that process. But many of the things that they did, I think I would certainly um, encourage them to do again, but I would also add a few things. So they started with interviews, simple interviews with key stakeholders, and the very first thing they did was they asked open-ended questions. What, what skills do you think are important for kids? What emotions, what interpersonal skills do you think are important? Um, what kinds of emotions do you think kids feel and experience? So they left it very open, nothing directed. They didn't say, do you think this is important? Do you think this is important? Once they were done with that and they took a look at those qualitative interviews, they actually went back to the same people and said, OK, so you've highlighted these things. We agree with this. What about curiosity? What about creativity? What about helpfulness? So if they hadn't identified some of the skills that from a Western perspective we think are important, they wanted to know, you know, is this something that's important to, to them? One of the reasons they did that is because, you know, often when we think about if we were asked to list the skills that are important for our kids, um, the social skills that are important, there are things that we sort of just take for granted. And you wouldn't think to list, like being nice to one another. Well, you know, yeah, of course. I mean, that's what a kid should do. Or um, responding to an adult when they're asked to do something. So we wanted to go back and make sure that some of the things that were left off weren't left off because they just assumed that we knew that. Um, and some of the things actually were left off because they assumed we knew it. And some of them were things that they'd never actually even considered, which was important information because we then didn't include that um, in a measure. Or at least we talked about whether it was something that we wanted to include and wanted um, them to think about. After we identified a bunch of different skills and competencies, um, and I'll, I'll go through what we actually ended up using in just a second, um, we really went back again to say, OK, you didn't identify, let's say, cooperation, although they did. But let's just say that you didn't identify cooperation. Why don't you think this is important? You know, what do you, how do you think this might look in your society if it were important? Um, do you see any of this happening? If they were able to identify examples of a particular behavior, we also considered that part of our scale, to, or we added that into our scale. If they couldn't think about, about skills or behaviors, examples of these skills or behaviors, it was pretty clear that it was not something that they needed to function well in their particular society. As a final step, we went back to teachers and parents in particular, not necessarily local business owners, to sort of think, OK, if you think your child might leave the country and work somewhere else, do you think some of these skills might be important for them um, outside? So that we had a good picture of what it was that people thought were important. We then took those skills and we compared them to existing Western measures. Because why start over if we don't have to? Um, and what we discovered was, not surprisingly, there are a lot of skills that are, I mean, you, I'm not going to say universal because we're talking Tajikistan in the US um, at this point. But there are a lot of skills that overlap. and so. We wanted to make sure that we incorporated them because we want to be able to have data that we're able to say, look at how these kids are doing relative to these kids and, and other contexts. But there were a lot of skills that we don't necessarily ask questions about. Um, maybe it's because it's something that we talk about all the time in classrooms and we teach kids all the time, so we assume kids can um, understand 
helpfulness. We can assume that kids know some of these um, types of behaviors, cooperation, kindness, those kinds of things. Um, or, and so we don't necessarily measure it. Or maybe it isn't a skill that we have research behind to say, hey, this matters. Whatever the reason is, there are things that we identified that, that they don't ask or that they didn't, um, they highlighted as important. And again, we'll look at that in just a second. Kristen, when, yes. when they were thinking about some of the skills, what age group did you say? Is it three to five? Is it kindergarten? Is it first to five? So we've actually done, the, the initial step was to develop this for ECD centers because that's where their primary focus was, early child development centers, childhood development centers. However, since that time, we've gone back to primary school teachers, and they, are, they will go back to secondary school teachers in the future. They're about to start a study um, with the primary school to say, OK, now the kids are a little bit older. Do these skills still matter? Are there other skills that are important? And their ECD program, is it preschool? It's, pre it's pretty much preschool, preschool. yeah. yeah it's, um, they do actually, so they have, they don't call it preschool. They have a grade zero, which is essentially our kindergarten. And then they don't have a kindergarten. They, have, they go from grade zero to grade one. And so they actually include kindergarten as ECD, um, unlike us. But, um, but, but it's three to five-ish, six-ish. Um, and so I, I'll say that, but then I'll also say that that varies by region. So some areas don't actually have a grade zero. They just do three, five, and then they go right into first grade. So there's a little bit of variability in the age at which kids start school across the country. Other questions? Um, so as I said, one of the biggest challenges was the language. <laughs> um, we, would, we would come up with questions, and then we would sit down and we'd say, OK, great, perfect tra Tajik translation. Here it is. We'd write it all out. We'd put it in our little form. And then we'd think, oh. Well, there's no word for that in Shugni. And we'd try and come up with a similar enough phrase that would allow us to ask the question that didn't bias the data so that we were getting different responses. And for some of our items, we were not able to do that. Um, sympathy is a word that does not exist. Sympathy and empathy, I should say, both of those words are words that don't exist in the Shugni language, or at least in the um, Tajikistan Shugni language. We later learned that they do, in fact, exist in the Afghan um, language, Shugni, Afghan version of the Shugni language, as well as the Kyrgyzstan. Um, but we had to really, we wanted to make sure that the measures were parallel. We didn't want to have different measures as a function of a language. It would be one thing if it was a function of culture and context, but it wasn't that they didn't think it was an important skill, it was just that they didn't have the language. Um, I should also say that the vast majority of our teachers um, in these contexts speak Tajik, most of them speak English probably better than I speak English. Um, and many of them also speak Shugni, because their kids are coming from villages where parents might speak Shugni and might speak Tajik. So the teachers were able to sort of help us think through, yes, this is an important skill, even though we don't have a word for it. Um, so again, we made sure that it was still culturally relevant, even though there wasn't a language for it. Initially, they developed three versions, one for teachers, one for parents, and one for children. 18-item um, questionnaire using three-point response scale, um, never one, uh, never, sometimes, and always. Now, I was not part of this up to this point. Um, I came in, actually, after this point. So um, you'll see in a second we've revised the scale. We now have four-point scale. We also now have more items. Um, and we're focused on teachers. So what they wanted to do was see who was a reliable um, respondent on this information. They didn't want to collect all of the data from everybody at this point, but they wanted to see who could actually respond reliably. Um, so they administered it to everybody. They piloted it with 38 primary teachers, 40 secondary teachers, um, but based on the ECD measures. So we didn't, we didn't, I mean, ECD items. We did not refine the tool to fit with these. These are based on um, what we identified or what ECD folks identified as important. Um, they used about 20% of the parents or 78, 78 parents. Um, and then they assessed, or they had 306 um, children participating. So, uh, you know, a decent size for just really looking at measure development and whether people can even answer the questions, let alone do um, anything else. Um, we conducted, this is, this is sort of where I came in, we conducted um, reliability analyses and exploratory factor analyses to sort of see, do we have just a bunch of skills that are, represent social skills, social competencies, or do we have different sets of skills um, here that we might sort of think about? 
Um, not surprisingly, this happens in the United States too. Inter-rater reliability or inter-rater agreement was really low. Parents didn't agree with teachers. Teachers didn't agree with kids. Kids didn't agree with anybody. Um, so, but kids aren't real good at this age of, of really being able to say, hey, I'm cooperative. Of course I'm cooperative. I'm a good kid. Um, I may be you know, your nightmare in your classroom, but from my perspective, I'm a good kid. So um, I had warned them that this was probably not going to work out well, but they wanted to go ahead and do it. Um, but we discovered quickly that teachers are um, pretty reliable. For the entire scale, internal consistency was about 0.84. I was actually pretty excited about that, given that we've sort of taken what we know, a huge body of literature, and dismantled it, essentially, and said, OK, let's just pick and choose what we think is important and add some random things that we've never assessed in there, or what, what are random from a Western perspective, clearly not for them. Um, we actually um, now have some additional data. That reliability um, has gone up to about 0.9. Um, so they've, they've continued to collect some data um, with kids. and so. There, the scale appears to be quite, this particular scale appears to be quite um, reliable. Also did this factor analysis and we found that we've got a set of skills that are sort of culturally valued traits. Um, not surprisingly, things like respect, responsibility, helpfulness, those kinds of things. Um, we have a set of skills that are related to academic success, creativity, confidence, curiosity, those kinds of things. And then a set of skills that are sort of more related to behavioral regulation, um, being patient, um, Kid isn't easily upset, um, handles frustration pretty well, um, listens, those kinds of things. So I was glad also to see that we could actually start to differentiate some of these skills and think about, you know, maybe this set of skills is going to be really important for learning, for academics, whereas these sets of skills are going to be more relevant to more social interactions, more interpersonal interactions. Um, certainly, behavioral regulation is also going to be related to academics as well, but I was excited to see that we could actually differentiate some of these skills to some extent as well. Um, this is a big table, and it's written um, in European or Asian style, so there's a comma instead of a period, but basically these are correlations. Um, and this is just to give you a sense. They, of course, are interested in the social skill, making the case that these social skills are important for learning. Um, and so what they did was they correlated the different things that we've got here. So we've got um, concentrates well, creative, um, empath em empathetic, um, not resentful, determined, patient. I can't read it up there. Um, disagreement, handles disagreements positively, follows directions, cooperative, respectful, motivated. And these were all done in questions. So these are just sort of the highlights. Curious, um, expresses one's opinion, um, responsible, etc. Anyway, what you can see is that we do have a, a fair number of correlations with, with both mathematics skills and with reading or tajik, the Tajik language. Um, this was a very cursory, these are simple correlations. And, and again, this is a very first step. We're actually just about to start a much more rigorous study. But this was just, toward, this was exploratory, really. Hey, is there something there? Um, have we created a measure that's actually going to be useful for us in, in looking at academic outcomes? So given all of this, I came in at the analysis stage. I said, well, if you're really interested in making the case that this is, these are learning-related skills, we really need to take a step back and maybe add a few items that, at least from a Western perspective, have been shown to be important for learning, things that are related more to cognitive control, executive functioning type skills, inhibitory control type of things. Um, and that's going to give you more credibility with your um, education department to be able to say, look, these are skills that we have evidence behind to show that they matter for learning, and we've assessed them. So I suggested we go back and add a few items in. We can't do direct assessments, unfortunately, right now. I think the goal eventually is to do that, but at this point, it's really a questionnaire. Um, so I suggested thinking about some items that are related to impulsivity, Things like maybe a child rushes into a new activity before finishing. So I, oh, look, there's something new, something shiny. Let me move on to that. Um, interrupts teachers and peers. Um, interestingly, uh, I observed in this last um, session that I was at, I observed a ton of classrooms. We did a ton of video coding. And kids are willing, more than willing to interrupt one another. But they don't interrupt the teacher. Teachers, on the other hand, are more than willing to interrupt the children without a problem. 
So it was very interesting to see because the kids are being, they're modeling, they're seeing this model who's willing to say, okay, whatever you're saying isn't really that important. Yet they're not willing to do it back to adults, but to one another, they're actually modeling or they're using that behavior. So it was very interesting to see. And reinforced that I was thrilled that we actually put some items in here that assess, assess this because I hadn't been in classrooms at that point. Um, looked at things like inhibitory control. Can they choose a perhaps more appropriate behavior in the situation rather than one they'd rather do, like get up and run around the classroom? Can they make that decision to sit still, for example, using an indoor voice instead of yelling across the room? Um, and those kinds of type, those kinds of behaviors. And then, as I said, sort of attention, executive functioning type skills. Do they focus on only one task at a time, or can they focus on multiple things? Can they pay attention to the tasks that they're doing? Well, there's lots of other activity going around, going on around the classroom. Um, are they able to sort of ignore or put aside that activity? Um, can they switch from task to task relatively easily without a lot of stress? Um, and do they have problems starting new tasks? So thinking about whether just that transition and that beginning new things is stressful to them. Um, so again, not the most comprehensive measure, but at least allows us to get a little bit of a sense of some of these behaviors for these kids. And I'm happy to share the measure um, if you're interested in seeing it. So we ended up with a 23-item tool that we're going to use with teachers, um, or have used and will continue to use. Um, we extended the response scale from three points to four points, so we've got a, at least a little bit of variation, just like us, just like people in the US. If there's a choice of a middle, value, that's what we choose. So a lot of our teachers were choosing ones instead of threes or, I mean, instead of twos or zeros. So now we've at least got some variability here. They have to think a little bit about whether the, the low end or the high end of one or two. Um, and then we repilot, we have started to repilot the tool. Um, this is one of our ECD classrooms. This is one of the AKF um, funded ECD classrooms. Um, this was, I visited this this summer. Um, I just wanted to sort of give you a sense I wasn't sure what to expect. I mean, these are truly remote villages. This is about an hour and a half from Korog. Um, I didn't put a picture of the bridge in here, but when we pulled up to the bridge, um, one of my colleagues brought her little girl with her. She tries to bring her kids um, to the different places that she goes so they can see that not everybody lives like them. And we pulled up to the bridge, and she goes, we're not driving across that, are we? <laughs> I mean, it was as rickety as you could imagine. I just sort of held my breath. Um, but I know that that's, they drive across it all the time. So I wasn't really sure what to expect. And when we walked in, I was like, this looks like any other ECD classroom that you would expect to see. Kids' stuff is on the wall, um, organized, got labels. Um, kids are, this is, this is the difference. Quietly playing. You, there's not, I mean, they're, they're talking. But it's very quiet. It's very calm. And it's, I was just like, <laughs> and then one of them might do something, and the teacher would say, um, oh, yeah, they're, they're, there's a guest here. They're not behaving as normally as they were. I was like, oh, you'd die in the U.S. if you saw what our kids look like. Um, so, but they're very, very um, comfortable in the classroom. Um, these, are, these are kids who are going to start grade one next year, um, or this year, actually, they started grade one. Um, and they're actually doing our, some of our pilot stuff with us. So we're going through some of the questions um, with them. They're sitting here. This little kid was... Um, very, really wanted to be part of it, but was also like, ooh, people are paying attention to me. So he wasn't quite sure how to handle that. Um, teachers were really good with him, and um, eventually, they were all playing on their own, but eventually they became fascinated in what we were doing and moved up to sort of be with us. Um, this is the village. So um, this is where the school is in this building here. It's an AKF-funded school. Um, it's probably got some support from USAID as well, but it's mostly AKF-funded. And then this is um, one of the maybe three houses that we saw. Now, I'm sure there were other houses because there were plenty of kids. And I don't think they all came from the same family. Um, but they, I mean, there weren't, there was just not much around. Um, there's uh, a little dirt pathway. You can sort of see it. We're, we're about to walk across it that leads back by that house and back up to the school. Um, no running water. Um, this is super fresh, super clear water. They actually don't boil their water. Um, I do boil my water, their water, but they don't. Um, it's mountain water, and they assume it's fresh. Um, most of the USAID folks also say, you know, we don't know what died upstream. And so while it looks clean, um, they, have, they have pretty much decided that they mostly boil or drink, drink their water, um, drink bottled water. But um, no running water. Um, no indoor plumbing, um, 
they do have access to water, clean, um, water in tanks and stuff like that, but, but not in the schools. Um, and they don't have, like I said, they don't have indoor plumbing. I also came to appreciate indoor plumbing after my first visit, especially in the summer, so it gets hot. So you're in these, these they're not even outhouses, these buildings that don't smell very good because it's so hot outside. It was much more pleasant this trip when it's much cooler. Um, so with that preliminary analysis of this new measure, we don't have a ton of data yet. They're still collecting it. 30 kids, about eight teachers, we're still getting reliability estimates with these new items of 0.79. So it's gone down a little bit, but we're talking 30 kids. We're not talking a lot of data here. Um, since that time, uh, we've collected actually quite a bit more data. They're entering it, and so we'll start to look at that reliability and make sure that it holds. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll do some item analysis and figure out what doesn't go in there um, or what doesn't belong in there or whether some of these new items are what's, what's driving um, what's happening. So this tool will be used to track socio-emotional development from ECD through third grade right now. They're basically about to start a very rigorous um, randomized control trial. And they've got groups of kids. Um, they're ECD kids, so kids who participated in AKF. They were part of 40 different schools. And they also have those same 40 schools um, or those same communities where the 40 schools are also have elementary schools that they're going to in, um, involve in something called a school improvement program. And this is basically improvement of instructional quality and emotional climate. So it's really the intervention that I mentioned at the beginning, trying to improve instructional quality. And then we have our two control groups, kids who just attend ECD and then go off to some of these other schools and kids who don't attend ECD. Um, we're going to treat these, ideally we're going to treat these as three separate groups. Um, however, there are not a lot of kids who don't attend ECD, so it's possible that we're not going to be able to do that. But I ask them to consider collecting the data this way so that if we do get a sufficient number of kids who didn't attend ECD, we can look at the package versus just ECD versus nothing. Um, so that's the goal. I don't know if it will happen. Um, in addition, we wanted to get a sense of the children's sort of sense of social support. Um, we added a social support measure that they've used in lots of different contexts. And again, I'm happy to share that. Asking kids about whether if they had a problem, there was somebody they could talk to, whether they were loved, whether they had friends, um, those kinds of things. So really just a sense of if there's some, is there somebody around that can support me? Um, the reason we wanted to ask this is because this is going to be used in a lot of our more violent, more high-risk communities and neighborhoods. And so we wanted to have a tool that we used across context, even though we don't expect there to be too many kids who are saying no here. Um, we expect that we'll see that more in some of the other contexts that we're working in. So our second sort of phase, and I'll go through this pretty quickly because this is new and we don't have, a lot of, we don't have any data on it, in fact. Um, but this is what I did last week, or two weeks ago. This is what I came back from last week, is this school improvement piece. So we want to integrate emotions into the classroom, um, think about developmentally appropriate practices um, for instruction about emotions. Uh, we brought a bunch of people together at all levels, so primary ECD, primary and secondary, to have these conversations about what this might look like. Um, some really rich conversations thinking about, well, we can't do that in a secondary school. They've got different teachers. How do we think about this? And so we really problem solved together, which was nice. Um, started with conversations about what our emotions are as adults how we manage them, how we identify them, how we think about them, recognizing that without that, we're going to be no good to our kids. Once we recognize those, we can help our children sort of think about that. We talked about how we model that behavior, how we can organize our classroom, um, thinking about the structure of where desks are, where toys are, where I am as a teacher relative to everybody else, that kind of stuff, um, that facilitates not just emotional expression, but engagement in sort of emotion regulation type things. And then we also um, developed a classroom observation tool based on the tool that they have, as well as based on other existing tools that really assess emotional climate, um, to assess the strengths and areas for improvement in the teachers. And then we'll use those to target professional development. And then that's where the intervention is really going to come in, is sort of thinking about the classrooms that receive this targeted professional development around emotional climate and instructional quality, but really emotional climate. They do instruction pretty well there. Um, and so really, obviously, since they have almost 100% literacy rates. Um, and so we're really focused in this particular case on that emotional climate um, with the goal of improving learning experiences. So we first took a very, I mean, the, the 
Socio-emotional measure looked easy relative to this one. When I got involved in this, I was like, oh, I'm exhausted. But we took a very comprehensive pro um, approach to tool development. So we took the tool that they had using those dimensions that we were interested in for instructional quality and sort of picked each one apart and thought about what's this look like, what's it look like when it's done well in the classroom, what's it look like when it's done poorly, what about in the middle, how do we describe that, how do we make a tool and that people can use to go in and assess that, and how do we describe that. So they had two broad dimensions, which they didn't actually pull apart very well, assessment and evaluation, as well as lesson and strategy, uh, yeah, lesson and strategy, lesson strategy and delivery. Um, and so what we did was we went through and said, well, what's that mean? And we did this with the teacher, with the professional development folks and with the teachers, actually. Um, what's that mean? What's it look like? What do you, what, how do you assess? How do you evaluate? And then we go back and say, okay, so best practice would say, for example, encouragement and affirmation never came up. Um, we don't encourage. We don't, we don't affirm answers. We just move on to the next answer um, is what the responses would be. So we added a dimension that would really give that sort of emotional climate um, some weight, if you will. Um, effective use of um, relevance pedagogy. This is something that's really critical to them, sort of taking kids' interest and interests that are relevant to the community and integrating them into the lesson. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we have um, good markers of that. Um, so again, these are the domains. I'm happy to share the tool, um, although we're still refining it after this last workshop. Um, and then we did the same sort of thing, but with emotional climate. We wanted to come up with dimensions of emotional climate. We drew on things like the classroom assessment um, scoring system, which is the class here, as well as the Eckers, which is a quality, also a quality, um, preschool quality um, climate or environmental rating scale is what it is. Um, to come up with things like positive and negative climate, this is very similar to the classroom assessment system. Um, behavior management, some pieces similar, some pieces very different. Certainly the way we describe it and the way they identify these behaviors, very, very different from what the tool, the classroom tool, if you're familiar with it, has. And then we've got some, issue, some things here that we don't even assess in the classroom um, assessment system. Um, and so we went through this whole process. They'd create it. I'd read it and say, no idea what you want me to look for. You need to refine this. You need to help me think about this if I'm going to come and observe. And then this workshop that I did, we watch videos. That's pretty much what we'd have conversations, and then we'd watch, watch videos. I would code it. Um, I'm, I'm trained in the classroom assessment system, so I do a lot of classroom observations with that. I'd code it. I'd, I'd listen to what they had to say. I'd give them my assessment. We'd talk about why. We'd, walk, we'd think about what was missing that would help us better understand that um, and really tried to refine this tool. Rather than a count, we used a one to seven scale. So we're looking at quality divided into sort of groups, not meeting expectations. So one is generally the worst. Um, two being mostly you don't do very well at it, but once in a while you show a glimmer of hope, something that we can catch. Um, developing, so you're, you're, you're getting there. Um, this, is, this is a group, these are the groups of teachers that we really know that we can move to the next level. Um, these teachers are going to be quite a bit harder because they're way at the other end. Um, but again, these are very broad descriptions and then each dimension has a, an incredibly specific sort of description of what to look for and we added to that based on conversations. And we also divided it by prim ECD primary and secondary things to look for. Um, and then proficient, so doing really well, um, generally. With, with some, the sixes, you know, you once in a while have a developing skill in here. Um, did more qualitative interviews, teachers, these education methodologists who are our professional development staff, um, conduct, and then we conducted this two-part, four-day regional workshop. Um, two days I spent lecturing about emotions. What are they? What do they look like? How do we do this? Blah, blah, blah all those things. Um, how do we teach it? Gave them examples from our classrooms. Um, talked about what they could do to make these appropriate for their classrooms, if they were appropriate. Um, how do you do this at the primary level, at the secondary level? We had one secondary guy who was fabulous. Um, he's a, he was a physics teacher. And he would, just, he would just take everything from an early childhood perspective and say, OK, like we use the emotion thermometer. OK, so let's think about this. My kids are learning about wind. Let's think about a barometer and use this. And I was like, you're awesome. Can I bring you back with me so that I can use you in the work that I'm doing? But he really thought carefully about it. Um, this, is a, this, this guy is actually from um, Afghanistan. And he's trying to make sure he understands why this really matters. 
So I, I could tell which ones were our teachers because they'd get up and they'd draw pictures. So basically, this is what he drew. This is our kid. This is, these are emotions. This is achievement. Um, and what he said was, we want to sort of keep even keel, right? We don't want to be too emotional because that will take away from achievement. And we don't want to be too focused on achievement because then we don't attend to emotions and interpersonal skills. So our goal is to figure out how to keep kids generally here or how to get them back here when it gets out of balance. And I was like, I mean, this is the first time he's been exposed to this. And I thought, this is fabulous. I mean, this is the best way to help people really understand that, um, thinking about this equilibrium. And our goal is to come up with strategies that allow us to generally maintain or return to that equilibrium. So we did two days on emotions, and then we did two days on this classroom observation. The classroom observation tool was really more, um, it was as much development as it was sort of getting people to understand why we're doing this, why we think it's important, um, as well as how we think about it. They haven't certified anybody. You'll see in a second the next steps. Um, but they really, we really wanted to generate conversations about, do you, do you buy into this? Do you think we need to do this? And they were 100% behind its importance. I mean, they were very committed, very rich conversations about what we do, what we don't do in the classroom, what's not good for our kids. Um, when we watch the videos, they would say, yep, looks like a typical classroom. We need to work with that teacher on these different aspects. They got it really quickly. Again, I was like, at the end, I gave a little, you know, thanks for coming and all this kind of stuff. And I said, I would really like to bring any of you who want to come home with me because you could really make a difference in the work that we're doing. This is just a, these are just a couple of pictures of them working. We gave them a lot of independent work. We gave them a lot of scenarios to sort of think about, to talk through to think about how this would apply at, within your country. So we had countries work together sometimes, but then we also mixed it up by developmental period. So what's this look like in ECD? Um, they were a very quiet group. Oh, well, they weren't quiet, actually. They were very engaged. But when we gave them an assignment, boy, they were 100% committed to it. And this is one of the um, on the ground. She, she works for IPD, or sorry, for AKF, um, the Aga Khan Foundation. And, but she was, she's my translator. <laughs> she was the one who took everything I said and translated it for me. Um, and she really does a phenomenal job um, in, in the area. This is another sort of active learning. Unfortunately, it's a blurry picture. But they were trying to figure out one of the emotional climate scales is reverse scaled, reverse scored. So low is good and high is bad if you're looking at negative climate. So they were trying to sort of come up with how do we understand that? Because everything else is the other way. They drew this scale. And then they said, OK, so what, what's closer to 0? Um, what's or what's a higher number? What's good? And so they went through this whole sort of mathematics process with one another to try and understand why when we look at um, the positive scales, 7 is better, 7 is good. And when we look at these, this negative climate, why the lower values are, are better. Um, so it was, it was just another great sort of active learning engagement. So where are we now? Um, almost to your pictures. Um, I'm going to work with AKF, continue to work with AKF and IPD Institute for Professional Development there um, to train staff to become the gold standard coders on this classroom observation tool. So they're going to videotape more classrooms, transcribe them for me, send them to me. I'm going to code them. They're going to code them independently. And we're going to figure out you know, at what point do we agree on what we're seeing. Um, we have refined and conti are continuing to refine the tool a little bit. Um, and then we'll, we'll engage in this. Um, the educational methodologists who attended this workshop are going to go um, off for now into their communities, ask more questions about the tool and some of the refinements that we've made, um, and then come back for additional training on not just assessment, but also on this classroom observation tool. And then we're going to collect, begin collecting data in December. Now, they're not going to be ready for the classroom observation piece, but we're, we're videotaping that, so it doesn't matter. Um, Right now, what we're doing is collecting pre-test data, December to about February, depending on the weather. Um, as you can imagine, if you don't have roads, if they're all dirt, weather is a big problem. And if your sort of average elevation is about 8,000 feet and you go up from there, um, you really have some serious problems. So we are going to collect data with, at minimum, 600 kids. We're aiming for about 1,000 kids. Um, and some of that, again, is going to depend on how far out we can get. Um, they're going to take the 40 schools, and they're going to use 20 program, 20 control schools. 
Um, and then they're going to assess things like math, Tajik, science, um, socio-emotional development, social support in the classroom, and the classroom quality. Um, again, really just trying to get a sense of whether integrating this professional development into the classroom makes a difference for kids, as well as whether socio-emotional skills are, are related to math and Tajik and science in this particular context. Um, this is pre-test. We'll do post-test um, for the next three years. We're going to collect data um, in the fall and spring for the next three years. Um, I said for fall, but apparently it's also spring. Um, classrooms, as I said, are going to be videotaped, and we'll code this um, probably mid um, late fall or late winter, early spring. We'll start coding once they're trained, but at least we've got. We're not going to have started interventions yet. Um, those will actually start next academic year, starting in August. Um, we'll start to do that professional development. Um, I just said that. And we'll continue to do some of our descriptive analyses just to see what these kids are looking like because they've never assessed socio-emotional skills in this context, um, nor have they ever assessed emotional quality of the classrooms. Um, and then we'll certainly start to look at impact as we get that impact data. Um, ideally, what we're trying to do is develop regional capacity. So we've brought people in from various places. We're hoping that they, we know, we're not hoping, they will go back to their countries and do similar processes. Their, um, Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan are both working on development of the socio-emotional measure tool first. Um, the reason we do that first is so that we can make sure that the classroom observation tool assesses some of these, um, these skills that we're hoping that they develop. Um, Tajikistan is sort of our model. I just said all this. Um, and we'll continue to support this process, and now we're moving to East Africa. Um, maybe India, but most likely East Africa. So we're going to start this process in Kenya, hoping that folks from Tanzania, Kenya, um, and at this point, that's what they're thinking, but maybe um, somewhere else will come together to do a similar sort of set of processes. So pictures. This is my road, and this is a nice part of the road. I want you to know this is a very well-groomed part of the road. Uh, you can see it's spectacular in terms of the views, um, but this is, this is, like I said, a really good part. First time in my life I've experienced having to wait for hundreds of goats and sheep to walk along the highway. They, we had to stop traffic so that they could move, the shepherd could move his, his goats and sheep. They do a lot of, um, they have a lot of sheep and go or goats that are cashmere, and they do, they raise isn't the right word, raise cashmere. Uh, they, Grow isn't the right word. Whatever it is, they do something with cashmere, and then they export it, about 80% of it to the U.S. And USAID actually um, provides women with um, um, looms so that they can spin the cashmere and then send it out. So some of these guys are um, cashmere as well. Just another picture. You can again see they are working on building some walls on the road so that there's not as much trouble with rock slides. Trip back 18 and a half hours because there was a rock slide and they closed the road. Um, these are some other pictures. These are the Premier Mountains. Um, this is the river in one of the villages that we stopped in um, that goes, sort of goes through the river. Um, these look a little bit washed out up there, unfortunately, but the colors are beautiful. This is Afghanistan. Um, and if you look across the river to Afghanistan, it really makes the road in Tajikistan look fancy <laughs> because it's terrible over there. And <laughs> it just stops. So you'll be driving along, and then there's no road whatsoever. So. I felt lucky that I actually had a road that went all the way through. Um, this is one of the villages. Uh, this is a restaurant that overlooks the water, and then there's the little village there. Probably one of the primary residents are cattle. I have never seen so many cattle in my life, especially along the road. Um, what I love about it, I mean, I'm a huge animal person. They'll go 90 to nothing along these dirt roads, and then if they see a cow or a chicken, they'll slow down and creep along. I'm like, you'll probably kill a kid at the rate that you go, but they will slow down for the cattle and the um, goats and the chickens and everything like that. So another picture. It's truly a beautiful place. This was now, so they're just starting to get snow. Um, this was last week. Um, they do still keep snow in the, mount in the high mountains all, all year. So even when I was there in August, there was quite a bit of snow in the, in the high peaks. Highest elevation is about 17,000 feet. Um, you fly over, um, and it looks like they're just right below you. I mean, they're so tall. Um, so questions, comments? Yes. So 
you coming in and, and you know, people coming in from outside, you talked about developing this culturally relevant, you know, um, measure. And I'm just wondering if there was any pushback from people, if there was any sort of like, who are these people that are coming in and telling it? You know what I mean? Because they're, they're a lot of like what you were saying about the kids listening respectfully to the adults where, you know, but the adults, I mean, there's a lot of cultural arrogance that's coming in and judgment. And I'm wondering how you avoided that and if you got any pushback. That's, that's a great question. So we went in and did ground up. This was all driven by them. The people who were there are all Tajik or Shudni or Russian or, you know, they're, they're locals. They're the ones who identified the sets of skills that we would go back and ask questions about. Um, they are aware of the Western literature. I was there at, to talk about the skills that we have evidence for in the US that are important for learning. So my role was not to say, don't ask that question. My role was to say, if you want to have a bigger impact with funders and education ed agencies, you want to make sure that you ask some of these questions if they're relevant. My other role is to say, if we're going to scale this to, or we're going to do this in different regions, we want to make sure that we're asking some broad sets of skills that, that are more likely to be more universal than some of these other specific skills. But I did not come in and say that's not an important skill. Or you have to ask this skill about this skill because it is what we all ask about. It was all driven by them. So there was no pushback. Um, I don't know whether that'll be the case in, some, in another place. These people are incredibly well advanced. I mean, they're very, very much engaged in what they're doing. And, that, and they have the capacity to do what they're doing. And that's not going to be the case everywhere that we go. Um, we were, we've been very lucky with this, this group of folks. Um, but my role is not to do that. Um, so great question. All right. Nothing else? Question yes. related to that. Oh, you did mention that you did some teacher training about the language emotions in the classroom. So I can see how, you know, um, culture would be kind of a factor there that might affect, you know, the effectiveness of the training and in general, you know, would present some challenges. So can you tell a little bit more? Yeah, so what I did, what we did was we started with them telling me about emotions. Rather than me introducing, rather than me defining, they knew the workshop was on emotions. That's it. So the very first activity we did was, tell me about the emotions in your classroom. Tell me about what you feel. Tell me about what your kids feel. Tell me about you know, what you display. What do you label? What do you talk about? So it was all first driven by then. And in fact, the second day, I, then, I took a bunch of notes. The second day, I then used that in some of what I did. After that, I talked about some of the things that we talk about in the US. And I talked about cultural differences. I said, you know, we talk about emotions a lot in the US with our kids. We, talk, we identify emotions. We have emotion charts everywhere in classrooms. Um, and so it's, very, it's a very common language. But it was driven by them first. And then we built off of that. So there's certainly cultural differences. And we did have conversations about the fact that, for example, anger is readily expressed, but that love happiness, those kinds of things aren't as open. And so we talked about those challenges and whether or not they thought it was important. Is it only important to express anger or do you think it's good for kids to be able to express that they love one another or love a parent or that they care for somebody else? So it, again, it was really, I did not want to come in and say this is how we do it in the West and this is how you should do it. I wanted to get a sense of what they thought was important because it's not going to do anything. If I tell them how to do this and they don't buy into it, they're not going to do anything. It's not going to change. And so it was very much driven by what they, whether they even think it's important. Do they even buy into it as it was a first question. And they absolutely, at least they told us they did. Now they were brought there and told they had to be there. So maybe they just said that because they, um, they knew they had to. Except that I don't, I mean, they really got engaged, and I think, I, I got the sense that they really bought into it.